pleased to be here early on a Monday morning to talk about basic concepts of immunology. Um, I have a few conflicts that you can see in the syllabus, I think. Um, and uh, I decided that it's very hard to cover the whole of immunology in 30 minutes. So I'm going to give you a quick uh, reviser of what we talk about when we mean, well, what we mean when we talk about the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. And then I'm going to give you three things that I think, and this is just opinion, that are the most important new advances that have happened in immunology in about the last 10 years. And then we'll do a few cases. Now, I must stress, and I'll tell you this when I show you the cases, that these are not necessarily the answers that you would be expected to give on the boards. They're more to allow us to discuss the new immunology and how we understand diseases. And so I'll contrast that and I'll tell you what you should answer on the board if you get a similar question to this. Okay, so what do we mean? Uh, what are the arms of the immune system? This should be revision for you. Remember that the immune system has an innate immunity arm and the innate immune system, can you see my pointer? Yes, contains cells. Uh, these cells are things like neutrophils, eosinophils, natural killer cells, but it also contains proteins. Now, why do nephrologists need to know about this? Notice that some of these proteins complement super APOL1, you might hear later on in this course, these are becoming markers, biomarkers that we follow to understand inflammation in the kidney. And in many diseases, for instance, crescentic glomerulonephritis, we think that this innate immune system is being dysregulated. How does it work? Well, the innate immune system works through PRRs, pattern recognition receptors. They pick up invading pathogens normally, and that triggers inflammation. Contrast this with the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system's job is to provide us with immunity and to give us lifelong protection against the infections that we've encountered. And the adaptive immune system contains T cells, B cells, and then it also contains proteins like cytokines and antibodies. This adaptive immune system is driven not by pattern recognition receptors, but by specific antigens. So usually it's very specific to an infection, but heaven help you if you get a, pattern, a, a specific T cell or B cell that attacks, let's say, um, part of the glomerulus, and we can talk about that a little bit later. These two arms of the immune system talk to each other, and you can see here I've put dendritic cells in the middle, because there are some cells that we consider part of the innate immune system that can endocytose pathogens or antigens and then present them to T cells and B cells. And so dendritic cells sit at the sort of interface between these two arms. So let me tell you a couple of things that I think were pretty surprising to me in the last couple of years. First of all, we didn't know where the immune system resided. So when I was at medical school, if somebody said to me, tell me about the immune system, I would have pointed here to the uh, axillae and maybe here to the inguinal areas. And maybe if I thought about it a little while, I might have pointed to the spleen. But what we now know is that by weight and perhaps by importance, a lot of the immune system is in the gut. And what I'm showing you here is something called an S- ED, a sub-epithelial dome, uh, and some people used to call these Peyer's patches. Maybe Dr. Renke will still call them Peyer's patches if I show them to you. But these domes reside under a specialized cell in the, epi in the epithelium of the gut. And remember that the gut is packed with pathogens, or at, uh, I should say potential pathogens. And the immune system has to allow us to live happily with these pathogens, to keep them in check so that they don't invade us, but at the same time not to overreact and give us inflammatory bowel disease. Um, how does the immune system do this? Well, it turns out that there are these M cells, and I'd never heard about these in medical school. M cells stands for microfold cells, and microfold cells allow antigens from the gut to trickle through the epithelium 
and to be picked up by dendritic cells in these subepithelial domes. These antigens from the gut can then be presented to the T cells and B cells. And in many cases, this generates a um, tolerogenic response so that we're not overreacting to the antigens in our gut. It also trains our gut on what to do when these bacteria become invasive. Uh, there are other mechanisms to get antigens or to, or to sense antigens from the gut. And here I've shown you one of them. This dendritic cell has sent up a little snorkel that can go between uh, epithelial cells of the gut, and then it can sense what's happening in the gut. Now, why do we care about this as nephrologists? Well, it turns out that the microbiome is very important. When I study mice with lupus, if I put them in a dirty room, they die about three months earlier than if I put them in a clean, sterile room. We know that the microbiome is very important at influencing autoimmune disease. I don't know yet what to tell my patients how to adjust their microbiome. Many of them say, should I go onto a gluten-free diet? Should I cut out meat? We don't know what we're doing yet. But I think, keep an eye on this, I think we are going to be learning how to adjust this in order to treat our uh, ki our, our kidney diseases. Um, I'd also point out, and maybe this will come up in an IgA lecture, we may be able to treat the inflammatory response in the gut. So there are now studies in IgA looking at steroids that aren't absorbed. That means that the steroids are sitting here in the gut and mainly influencing these gut responses to the microbiome. And it seems that those may be effective in lowering the levels of IgA and lessening the numbers of flares. Most of the IgA that we produce are made by this gut-associated uh, lymphoid tissues. So that's thing number one. I didn't even know where the immune system is. Thing number two is I didn't realize how depressive B cells are. They're very depressed. Uh, here's a B cell and I, I will remind you that B cells usually on their cell surface have something that immunologists call the B cell receptor. And really what that is, that is an immunoglobulin sitting on the B cell surface. And uh, when that immunoglobulin is engaged by its antigen, what happens? The B cell dies. B cells see their antigen, they get depressed, and they die. So how do we get autoimmune disease? How do we get immunity? It turns out that we need to encourage these B cells. We need to encourage them to become plasma cells and plasma blasts. And there are TNF family members that we now recognize are absolutely critical for this. Uh, I've shown you two of them here, BAF and APRIL. BAF stands for a B cell activating factor of the TNF family. No one can remember that, just call it BAF. <laughs> and uh, APRIL stands for a proliferating inducing ligand. I can't remember that either, and so I call it APRIL. And BAF and APRIL, I'm going to show you here, can be on the cell surface, but they can also be cleaved and soluble. And um, these BAF and APRIL then interact with one of four different receptors on the B cell and they give the B cell encouragement. And I tell my medical students, this is the erythropoietin for B cells. So we know as nephrologists, if we don't give people erythropoietin when they're in renal failure, what happens to the erythroblasts? They also depress, they die. Um, here we have B cells, when they become activated, uh, if we don't stimulate them with BAF or APRIL, then they die. And uh, I think this is going to be important. Already a BAF inhibitor called belimumab is available for the treatment of lupus. It's not very potent, and we use it mainly as an adjunct therapy to help uh, people with arthritis when they're on mycophenolate, when they're on prednisone. Um, but I think we're going to be targeting these things going forward. Um, April is interesting from a nephrology point of view because... April stimulates this April receptor, and the April receptor seems really important 
in telling a B cell to make IgA. And so there are clinical trials looking at blocking April. I don't have any data to tell you how well they work, but I suspect that we're gonna be trying that to lower IgA levels going forward. Here's the third thing that I learned, and that is that T cells are not all the same. T cells have different personalities. Here I've shown you, this is not to scale, I'll point out. Uh, here's a tiny little thymus producing this naive T cell, and it turns out that depending on the environment where the T cell matures, the T cell can actually become an effector cell, which I've shown you here at the bottom. And some of these effector cells are CD8 expressing. That means that they can pick up antigens presented on MHC class one. Usually this is a virus. And these are what we call cytotoxic T cells. Here, the CD4 T cells, we sometimes call helper T cells, and you can see they come in a number of different flavors, but all of these red guys are effector cells. They promote immune responses. Contrast this to the green guys up here, the regulatory T cells, and these regulatory T cells make cytokines that calm down immune responses. Now, in the last couple of years, we've learned a lot about what controls whether a naive T cell becomes an effector cell or a killer cell. And the most important thing that I think is coming into the clinic that we're gonna see more and more is that checkpoint inhibitors are critical in making this decision. And we're seeing more and more people on PD-1 inhibitors for various cancers. And I think other checkpoint inhibitors are also coming into practice. Now it turns out that the PD-1 ligand actually pushes naive T cells to become regulatory T cells, and that's why you don't respond to a cancer. If we inhibit that PD-1 signal, then you get more effector T cells, and the immune system kills the cancer or at least keeps it in check. We have to be aware of this because every now and then we're seeing patients with interstitial nephritis who are on these checkpoint inhibitors, and perhaps you'll hear in the interstitial nephritis lectures a little bit more about this. But basically, in cancer patients, we're pushing the cells towards effector cells, and sometimes you get bystander injury of the kidney when you do that. Okay, so just for fun, I thought I would introduce you to a few cases. Uh, here's a 62-year-old woman. These are not mystery cases. Uh, they're to show you some new stuff that we've learned about the pathobiology of these diseases. So a 62-year-old woman presents with anchor antibodies and progressive glomerulonephritis. Which of the following is least likely to contribute to her disease? Is it the neutrophils, the B cells and plasma cells that are making the anchor antibodies? Is it complement C5A? Is it the membrane attack complex? Or is it autoantibodies that target proteinase 3 and myeloperoxidase? Okay, let's see what people are thinking. And it seems like uh, a lot of people are taking a guess. <laughs> and that's okay, because this is kind of new stuff. That's why I put this here. Okay, I know about it because this is what I read. You guys read the whole of nephrology. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look. Um, so, so clearly neutrophils are important in anchor vasculitis. That's the target of the anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. Those antibodies are made by B cells and plasma cells. So I think uh, one and two are likely to be involved in anchor vasculitis. But what about these complement issues? Um, here we are. Let me just remind you that complement can be activated in three different ways. Um, at the bottom here is the classic complement cascade. This is when C1Q uh, is activated on an immune complex. A similar activation pathway can happen um, triggered by other pathogens where MBL, the le manin binding lectin, 
can bind lectins on a pathogen. Both of these involve the activation of the early complement pathway components like C4, C2, and finally you get activation of C3. The alternative pathway activates C3 just in a sort of constitutive tick-over pathway, and the net result of all of these things when I was at medical school meant that you made this membrane attack complex and punched holes into cells. What I kind of ignored was these little guys coming off on the side here. So here's C5A, C3A, and uh, C3F. What are these little things doing? Well, it turns out that these are, are chemotaxins. They call in neutrophils and other inflammatory cells to come into the area. This is part of the initial inflammatory response. You can imagine that one neutrophil can't fight an infection and so if you trigger this complement pathway, you're going to be able to call in a large number of inflammatory cells into the area. So a number of studies have been done looking at the role of complement in anchor vasculitis. And most of these use a mouse model where we take some uh, myeloperoxidase antibodies and we transfer that into the mouse. And you can see here, normal mice get about 10% crescents five to 10% crescents. Um, I'll tell you about this mouse in a second, but here if we knock out the C5A receptor, you find that there are no crescents. Even though we injected the mouse with lots of antimyeloperoxidase antibodies, no crescents developed. Here, when we knocked out, or when this group knocked out C6, part of the membrane attack complex, there was really no benefit to that. So it's interesting, right? I thought that complement worked by forming the membrane attack complex, but here in anchor vasculitis, the key thing seems to be not the membrane attack complex, but this chemo uh, chemotactic chemical, the C5A, that's being produced in response to the antibody deposition. Here, uh, Adrian Schrieber, his group uh, showed this at about the same time, knocking out C5A, very few crescents, very few uh, necrotic glomeruli. You can see here's a very damaged glomeruli for a mouse glomerulus, nice glomerulus in the C5A knockout. This has actually led to a clinical trial, and uh, in this clinical trial, 87 patients with anchor vasculitis were randomized. Uh, the medication that they used is called a vacopan, and that's a C5A receptor inhibitor. And what was shown, uh, I'll show you over here, is that um, there were very good responses in the patients who got the C5A receptor inhibitor. This trial was done in Europe. It's currently being repeated here in the US, but I think this is going to become an option. Uh, what's really interesting is in this trial, they used a vacaban in a steroid-free protocol. So they gave patients a combination of cyclophosphamide and a vacaban and compared that to cyclophosphamide and steroids. And I don't know about you guys, but I might have many patients who would be interested in a steroid-free way to treat their anchor vasculitis. Okay, so I think uh, the answer for this question is going to be uh, the membrane attack complex does not seem to be important in anchor vasculitis. Okay, how about this one? This is an easy one. A 70-year-old Caucasian man develops worsening proteinuria and is referred for investigation of nephrotic syndrome. Here's the kidney biopsy. And uh, I think most people will agree this looks like a membranous pattern of injury. Uh, he is most likely to have anti-PLA2R antibodies. And I want to know what ha where these come from and what they mean. So are these formed in immune complexes in the circulation? Do they target PLA2R that is released from leukocytes? Do they form immune complexes with PLA2R expressed on the podocyte foot processes? Is PLA2R or anti-PLA2R a biomarker of disease, but it doesn't really deposit in the glomerulus? Um, and does this activate or fix the classical complement pathway?
let's take a look what people are saying. And I think Larry Beck and David Salant have brainwashed you correctly <laughs> that uh, this is an immune complex forming in situ. Uh, oops, let's have a look. So we do sometimes see circulating immune complexes that get stuck in the kidney. And I think Helmut may show you this a little bit more. Classically, this happens in cryoglobulinemic GN associated with hepatitis C, and now very rarely uh, with serum sickness. Um, although I have seen one or two cases of serum sickness related to patients who get monoclonal antibodies like rituximab. And so uh, occasionally we do see that now. Um, here are the uh, beautiful pictures from Larry Beck's paper. And what you can see is uh, this green over here marks WT1. And there, these are the nuclei of podocytes. And the red marks PLA2R. And you can see that normal podocytes are expressing PLA2R. Uh, this is from a normal transplanted kidney at the time of transplant. And so uh, we know that normal podocytes express this antigen. And this is what's targeted by the anti-PLA2R antibodies. Uh, Larry was able to extract human uh, PLA2R from human glomeruli and also use recombinant PLA2R. And so what you can see is that the uh, PLA2R forms a complex with the anti-PLA2R in the glomerulus. And I think he'll tell you much more about that in the lecture about membranous nephropathy. Here you can see these sub-epithelial lumps that form. And um, we think that what happens is that the PLA2R antigen actually gets shed off the podocyte foot processes and lands up inside these lumps with the IgG4. And so this is an immune complex that is forming in situ, inside the uh, glomerulus. What about that uh, complement activation that I showed you? Well, it turns out that at least in anti-PLA2R disease, the vast majority of the immunoglobulin that is made is IgG4. And if you have a look at this um, review by Bruns from a few years ago, it turns out that IgG4 is the one type of immunoglobulin that is particularly bad at activating complement in the classical pathway. We have a lot of data from animal models that complement is important in membranous, but we don't actually know whether that's translatable or whether it's uh, actionable in humans. And so no trials have been done targeting complement treatment uh, to membranous nephropathy. So I think here you, most of you got the correct answer. That's three. Okay, um, last question. A 24-year-old woman presents with nephrotic range proteinuria and an active urinary sediment. She complains of photosensitivity and hair loss and arthritis. Which of the following pathways would you target to ameliorate disease if you were making a new therapy? And now I'll point out, if you get this question in the boards, I want you to say that you're going to give her high dose steroids and mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide. So what we're going to talk about here are sort of novel therapies that you can give, perhaps if those don't work. Oh, I must give you an opportunity to vote. So that's interesting. Most people would target the B cells using an anti-CD20 strategy. Let's have a look what we can tell you about sort of novel things. So let's talk about the TNF pathway first. So it turns out um, TNF, tumor necrosis factor, is elevated in many patients with lupus. But paradoxically, when we use anti-TNF strategies not to treat lupus, but to treat diseases like inflammatory bowel disease or rheumatoid arthritis, we actually get lupus. We, we can actually induce lupus with an anti-TNF strategy. And we are seeing this from time to time in our lupus clinic. 
it's usually not a patient that's referred to me. And I hope this projects okay, but here's a uh, meta-analysis of a couple of trials put together. Uh, what you can see, if we look at the bottom here, these patients present with ANAs, with anti-double-stranded DNAs, about 80 or 90% of them have antibodies to double-stranded DNA. Many of them have antihistone antibodies, and a few have anti-phospholipid antibodies and uh, antibodies to extractable nuclear antigens. That's what ENAs are, and that includes SM, RNP, and other RNA-like uh, antigens. But notice that most of these patients with anti-TNF-induced lupus present with skin disease. Um, somewhere between 70 and 80% of them have discoid lesions or photosensitive lesions or mouth ulcers. Um, arthritis is actually relatively rare, uh, being present only in about 30 or 40% of these patients, and renal disease is extremely rare. And so we see this because we have a multidisciplinary lupus clinic, uh, but it's kind of unusual that you guys are going to see this as the primary referral. Usually this is going to go to a dermatologist, and maybe there'll be mild kidney disease associated with it. But nevertheless, um, we usually do not use anti-TNF strategies to treat lupus patients because we think that it may make the disease worse. What about targeting complement in lupus? Well, we have talked about this with some companies, but it turns out it's tricky. C2 and C4 deficiency, so here's a nice summary table of what happens to you if you lack complement. And uh, for those of you who want to take the general boards, Remember that you get infections if you lack complement, and usually those are with encapsulated organisms. But notice that if you lack C1Q, C4, C2, you also get lupus or other forms of autoimmune disease. Now, why would that be? Well, it turns out that these early components of complement are involved in clearing away immune complexes, and so Autoantibodies forming a complex need to be cleared away, and if you lack these early complement pathways, that doesn't happen. And number two, these early complement components are also involved in clearing apoptotic cells. Now, why are apoptotic cells important? Well, we think that apoptotic cells represent the antigen that drives lupus. So these apoptotic cells are taken up by antigen-presenting cells, and then inappropriately, the DNA and RNA and other extractable nuclear antigens are presented to T cells for T cell help, and that then generates a B cell that can make anti-DNA or anti-RNA antibodies. As part of this antigen presentation, a lot of interferon is made. In lupus, we know that this anti uh, antigen presentation is often made by some, a specialized dendritic cell called a plasmacytoid dendritic cell, and so a lot of type 1 interferon is made. Here you can see that patients with lupus, this is these patients that are labeled with sleed eye here, compared to controls or compared to patients with rheumatoid arthritis, they often have this interferon signature. And there is now a trial that has targeted this. Unfortunately, a repeat trial seems to not be confirming this finding. So I think you could say that we think type 1 interferon may be important, but it's not a very potent thing to target. What about rituximab and a B-cell strategy? Well, we do use rituximab, and I do actually agree with you that that would be the right answer, but we don't have a lot of data to support it. Here's the data from the LUNA trial, and you can see uh, if they summarize, here's white patients, absolutely no benefit from using rituximab in addition to standard of care with prednisone and MMF. Here are Hispanic patients. Oops, I've lost my cursor. And uh, on the left there, you see African Americans. They seem to have a little bit of a benefit, although that was not statistically significant. Why did the rituximab not work in these studies? Well, we don't really know. One possibility is that the rituximab did not deplete properly. And here's a new obinatsumab, I said that correctly, I'm quite proud of myself. <laughs> um, anyway, this is a new anti-CD20 molecule that seems to be more potent 
particularly in lupus patients. Now, why might the rituximab fail in lupus patients? Well, you can get internalization of the CD20. And so what these authors are showing is that the new agent sticks on the cell surface for longer, and that may mean that the uh, B cells are targeted more efficiently. And they do show that here in vitro. There is a clinical trial right now on the go with this, and we're hoping that we can show some benefit. So I think I would have answered five, as most of you did. I think you would be okay if you answered type one interferon pathway should be targeted. Okay, so in conclusion, I've reminded you that the immune system has two arms, an innate arm and an adaptive arm. These talk to each other. They're both involved in renal disease, and you'll see this coming up as we talk about glomerulonephritis. The three new things about the immune system I told you is that the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue and the gut associated lymphoid tissue is much more important than we thought it was, and it may even be important for renal disease. I told you that B cells are depressed and they like to die if they don't have BAF or April, and T cells have lots of subtypes. And then we looked at a few cases just to show you potential new therapies. Thank you very much.